that's all I got today. And I got a couple of things to come back with next week. Just didn't want to take too long today because it's a holiday. And some of you are taking out your your uh, family for dinner and or you're taking out your moms. You're doing whatever you're you're celebrating. And so it's a good thing. Um, today we are in the book of John in our continuing study of the book of John. This is just the normal scripture that is in line in the book of John. We started the book of John a while ago already. Obviously, we're already in chapter 19 of the book of John. And yet, um, as we are in this book, you're going to notice a scripture that many people use on Mother's Day. Total, total lineup of the Lord, not me. Yeah, I'm telling you, because I, I had purposed in my heart never ever to use this scripture for Mother's Day. Honestly. And so the fact that it's here today means that it's pure. It is the Lord because I, when I purpose in my heart not to do something for Mother's Day, it ain't happening unless the Lord intervenes. And in his sovereign will, today, this is the scripture which I am sharing on Mother's Day. We are in the book of John, chapter 19. We're starting in verse 17 as we see Jesus giving his life for the sins of the world, as we heard from Scott already singing about today, and the justification that is ours because he has forgiven our sins. So today, uh, I simply have entitled today's message, The Mission Completed, The Mission to Pay for the Sins of the World. John chapter 19, verses 17 to 30. Uh, reminder, the scriptures are my translation of the New Testament. By the way, one of the, thing you'll read, one of the things you'll read in Eric Metaxas' book is that Luther got spirited away to protect his life to a place called the Wartburg. And he was there for about a year, but at, in, at one point he said, I need to translate the New Testament into German. He did it in three weeks. Now, it took a lot longer to edit it. They did a ton of editing, and it took forever to edit. Now, right now, I'm going through the editing process of the New Testament, you know, the version of mine that I've translated. But um, I was like, wow. Now, the other thing is he had very few resources. You know, one of the things we have is so many resources. Before I choose to translate a word, I can check 15 resources. Well, that all takes time. Okay, if you're going to, you know, certain words, technical terms, things like that. But, uh, and he had very few of those. But what he had was an amazing translation gift from the Lord. I, I can't even, you understand, we type. You know how fast that is from taking a quill and dipping it in an inkwell and then writing? Uh, and you're thinking to yourself, how did he do this in three weeks? Just, okay, just copy the New Testament longhand. Think about it. How long would it take you? And he translated all of the New Testament into German, writing it out in three weeks. The guy was amazing. Now, he was also a major Greek scholar. By the way, Melanchthon, his sidekick, he called Melanchthon his Greek scholar. That He was the guy that really knew the Greek language. And he's the one that then polished everything. You know, it was, it's always nice to have someone that knows a little bit more than you do. But Luther gave him the rough draft and amazing. So, okay. Anyway, this is my version. I've got a translation of the New Testament. I'm now in the editing process. You all know that. But it's always good to be able to uh, have your favorite translation in front of you until all the final edits are done. <laughs> and it's been peer-reviewed. Okay, John chapter 19. Now I'm starting on the second half of verse 16 just to be reminded of where we had come. Uh, G, uh, Pilate has just said, look, here's the man. Uh, it's not quite as... Uh, Behold the man. That's what, you know, Scott said. That's like one of the most iconic phrases in the entire English language. I said, I know, but it's old and ancient. We got to update the language for good or bad. Anyway, so right after that, they take him out to be crucified. And then it says they, they took Jesus and he carried his own cross beam and went out to the crucifixion site called Place of the Skull, which is called Golgotha in the Hebrew dialect. This is where they crucified him and two others with him, one on each side with Jesus in the middle. So he's, they, they, you always see the movies, they have him carrying an entire cross. That's not the way, it, it, they would do the cross beam thing. 
You carry your own crossbeam out. And uh, that was uh, heavy enough, and he was certainly able to do it for a bit. Remember what he'd been through already. He had been scourged where, you know, the, the scourging would normally l lay bare your ribs from the back and rip up your muscles. And so he carried his own crossbeam until he couldn't. It said he stumbled under the load. And then Simon of Cyrene was impressed. Remember the Romans could do this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, if they, or maybe 7, um, if, uh, if they impress you, if someone forces you to carry his pack one mile, take it two. Because any Roman soldier could walk up at any person in an occupied nation and say, here, and impress them for a mile's worth of work. So it was nothing for them to just walk up to someone in the crowd and say, here, you carry his crossbeam for him. I, by the way, what a privilege. What a privilege. This guy was probably already a follower or a disciple, um, but he definitely is later on referenced as a disciple in the New Testament. So he, he carried his own crossbeam out to the site until he could no longer carry it out to the site. It's called the Place of the Skull. Um, we call it a hill, but there's really no evidence it was a hill. We just don't know what it was, but yeah, it's a hilly area. So um, This is the picture of Jerusalem again. We saw it, I believe, last week. And uh, the bottom of the picture there has uh, the temple, the larger area, then then uh, the uh, Antonia, the fortress, which was where all the Roman soldiers were there. And many people assume Jesus was tried at Fortress Antonius. And then the Via Della Rosa, the Way of Sorrows, Jesus walking with the beam to the crucifixion site, which I've now circled at the top, um, or, you know, middle, about a little above the middle. Um, they think that that was the path. But as I've said, the Greek says he went, they were at the Praetorium. And the Praetorium is Pilate's Praetorium. It's a place that Herod built. And then you can see it's not quite as far. Well, and, you know, it's, a, it's just a quick you know, walk to the place of the crucifixion. And so this is the, the, the probable path from the Praetorium to Golgotha. Now, this is interesting because if you go to Jerusalem, you're always told, you know, this is where this was and this is where that was. Okay, so I've got something I just want to read. In A.D. 326, Queen Helena, Emperor Constantine's mother, made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem with the historian Eusebius. And Eusebius, you'll hear me quote once in a while. He's one of the well-known historians of the time, and he went to Jerusalem with the uh, emperor's mother. When asked about Calvary, the Christians pointed out it was under the Temple of Venus that Emperor Hadrian had constructed in A.D. 135. The Queen Mother paid for the destruction of the temple and the precursor of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Workmen uncovered several tombs in a rocky outcropping. That makes sense. You know, if the crucifixions, they'd put them, you know, rocky outcropping, great, no problem. Um, but that's the point is, is remember, Jerusalem had been destroyed. The Jews were kicked out, but the Christians were able to be back in the city really quick, and they knew where the events had happened. And so they said, this is where it is, under the Temple of Venus. So she destroyed it. The original Byzantine church was destroyed by the Persians in 614. It was rebuilt shortly thereafter. The Egyptian caliph Al-Hakim destroyed the church in about 1000 AD and had the, the tomb hacked down to bedrock. That tells you, I mean, there was some very ferocious response to the Christian veneration of certain sites. And so it's difficult to go to Jerusalem right now and say, this is where the tomb was. When you know that they hacked down one area to the very bedrock and got rid of all of the geographical, you know, signs, you understand it's it's an issue. Um, by the way, I've always I've never understood how anyone could go to um, the uh, place where Jesus and the disciples had the Lord's Supper on the second floor when most of the buildings were destroyed by the Romans. I'm like, well, I don't think that, okay. Uh, let's just say when you're told by the guide certain things happen here in Jerusalem, and, and go on those tours because it's great fun if you ever go to Jerusalem, but just realize, always take it with a grain of salt because this happened 2,000 years ago, and they didn't have video records. Okay, so anyway, so they uh, also, the insurrectionists, now remember Barabbas is called a robber. Insurrectionists, uh, insurrectionists often supported themselves by robbing from rich landowners. 
And apparently the Romans had caught these guys, Barabbas and his two cohorts. And you can tell they were his two cohorts because he was supposed to get crucified in the middle of them. And his two cohorts side by side. And they put Jesus on the cross that was intended for Barabbas. And so the insurrectionists were crucified on, e- on each side, which means he was like the kind of the chief, chief malefactor. He was the one that everyone was supposed to see as the primary criminal, and yet he had nothing to do with the two other guys. Then verses 19 and 20, Pilate also wrote a notice and placed it on the cross, Jesus the Nazarene, king of the Jews. So many of the Jewish people read this notice for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in the Hebrew, Roman and Greek languages. And uh, this was not something that this was. Yeah, I call it Pilate's aggression because that's what it was. He uh, he now um, had the upper hand. By the way, this is what the signs would have looked like. We don't you know, it's it's there's the Hebrew at the top. Then there's Greek and then there's Latin. Okay, the Hebrew reads right to left. Everything else goes left to right. And uh, so Pilate gets pretty aggressive. He just he says, (laughs) king of the Jews, Jesus, Nazareth, king of the Jews. And he leaves it that way. It was a real mockery because he's saying, I'm killing your king. And uh, their authorities didn't like it very much. Therefore, the Jewish chief priest complained to Pilate, do not write king of the Jews, but rather that he said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. He finally got a spine. Now, I told you last week or last time about the fact that he was in a very um, difficult position politically, and he had to make sure that he kept the peace in order for to pr- to preserve his position and if there was any hint of disloyalty against rome and that's when they said you know we have no king but caesar anybody who's a friend of caesar uh that's a that, that's a technical term that pilate's friend sejanus had had and had it revoked and uh you're no friend of caesar if you allow this to happen that was like hanging an execution notice over pilate's head And so for political reasons, he had to go ahead with the crucifixion because he was a coward, essentially. But he was a brutal man. And um, he uh, here got his backbone back because he'd already survived the test. If they complained to Rome about the fact that he said he's king, you know, that he doesn't change, Rome would have laughed. They just said, grow up. So they protested. Um, but they didn't have a hold on him any longer. So they were, he was able to say, what I have written, I have written. He finally got a backbone. It lets him know how angry he was because he was certainly angry at them for having forced him into this position. Because he did, uh, you know, nobody that's in government wants to be able to be forced or wants to be forced to have to do a certain thing. Happens all the time in politics. Um, sometimes you don't have a choice from human perspective. And that's why if you ever get into politics, you have to be bolstered by the presence of the Holy Spirit. You just do. Uh, some of the things which God requires of us as we serve him makes it look like we're about to go through a death experience. And you can lose office. You can lose, That's what it makes it all look like. But the only place we're going to find deliverance is standing on integrity. And if, it required, if that costs you your office, so be it. It's better that it costs you your office than that it costs you your soul. That's just the way it is. Then when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they divided his clothing into four portions, a portion portion for each soldier and the undergarment. But the undergarment was seamless, woven from the top down. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to determine who will get it. So how many soldiers were there? Four. And then they had the undergarment. So there's one for each of them. And uh, the undergarment was a one-piece garment. And the, uh, it says this happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled that says they divided my clothing among themselves and cast lots for my garment. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now, the normal clothing of a person would have been sandals, a sash, an outer robe, and the, a turban or headdress, and then the garment, the inner robe, the undergarment. And uh, so they were able to separate four items and then share them between themselves, saying, you know, you get this, you get this, you get this. That's part of the booty of being there. 
Um, however, they did not want to divide the undergarment because it was seamless and it would have been, it would have lost its value if they had ripped it. And so they cast lots for it and uh, that fulfilled Psalm 22, 18. And uh, they divided my clothing among themselves and cast lots for my garment. Uh, if you read the Old Testament, it says they divide my clothing among themselves. They cast a lot for my garment. But it's uh, the same quote. They're saying this fulfilled that particular scripture. The mother of Jesus was standing by his cross along with his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So Mary. Remember when uh, they were in the temple, when Jesus was first being presented at the temple, Simeon had said, a sword will pierce your, pierce your own soul too. And for her to see this happening to Jesus was certainly fulfilling that prophecy. A sword was piercing her own soul. You know, you wouldn't expect that uh, Mary would, because um, her son was perfect. I mean, mothers always have to deal with children who go astray or have bad things happen to their children, and they understand the sword that pierces their own soul because their children are either in trouble, estranged, or other problems, just other things happen to them. And so they, they understand that, the, the pain of that. But um, for Mary, having a son who had no sin nature and was um, able to do what he had done, this was a new experience to see him so rejected. Along, I mean, obviously, when they were in Nazareth and they were about to throw him off a cliff, that had to be a high difficulty moment, that sort of stuff. But she was uh, certainly in over, being overcome by grief standing there. Um, it says that the other people who were there, besides the mother of Jesus, were his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, these are the other scriptures that talk about those who were present. It says in Matthew 27, there was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So... You look at this scripture and you say, oh, Mary, the wife of Clopas, is also the mother of James and Joseph. And Mary's sister is the mother of the sons of Zebedee. You look at the next scripture, and there, was, there were also women who were observing events from a distance. The group included Mary Magdalene. Okay, got her. Um, Mary, the mother of the less prominent, James and Joseph. We got her. And Salome. Okay, same four women every time. It's just that they're identified a little bit differently to give us insight who they were. Salome was Mary's sister. James and John were then her nephews. And so that relationship was there. And um, so they're there by the cross, Mary the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, all those, Mary, Mary's sister, and obviously the two Marys, um, and so Jesus, they're, they're there watching, and it says, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Mother, look to your son. Then he said to the disciple, Look to your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Okay. Um, the disciple whom Jesus loved was his cousin John. Okay. Jesus had lots of cousins. They all did back then. Um, but as Jesus is sitting up there, uh, he looks at his mom. And by the way, normal translations translate it, woman, look to your son, or here is your son. And woman sounds so impersonal. It's the same as the, the, the uh, wedding at Cana. Woman, what, it might, has my, my time has not yet come. Um, that was a polite term of address to someone you respected in that culture. And in our culture, when we use a polite term of address to address the person who bore us, we call her mother. So if you want to translate the word woman correctly, you have to translate it as mother because woman's not a polite term of address in our culture. And so I'm telling you, this is the only faithful way to translate that. I am just sharing it. Or dear woman. I've that, those, they try to get closer. Dear woman, you know, but... Um, it's still just a little too distant, okay? It's just, it's not the same as um, the way it would have come off in that culture. So anyway, he's looking, and he sees that his mother is there. Uh, by the way, it's absolutely an inappropriate place for Mary to be right now. 
watching her son being crucified, and Jesus knows full well she should not be there. And he takes the steps of honoring his mother. Um, and and you, by the way, because it's, it's the only commandment with a promise. That's what Paul calls it. The only commandment with a promise. Honor your father and mother that it may be well with you and you may live a long life on the earth. Well, Jesus was going to live a long, long time after his resurrection from the dead. He's still alive today. Um, and not just in the heavenly sense. His body was resurrected and, and, and revived and he's been glorified. But he was going to obey that scripture of honoring his father and mother. His mother was already gone. So, I mean, his father was already gone. So now it was time for him to honor his mother and to carry out his role as the eldest son. And that was now that he was going to be gone, watching that his mother was cared for. And he did have brothers and sisters. And so certainly this was a little bit of a sidestep around them because that would generally be where you would have gone. It's the, the brothers and sisters who are involved in making sure now that you're not going to be there. But this is also Mary's family. The, the Salome, her sister. And so it's not quite as grievous as if Jesus had just taken Mary and said, you need to go into some stranger's household. This wasn't a stranger's household. Remember, those households were knit together. It just made perfect sense. And so, and plus, who knew, knows where his brother was? John was there, and someone needed to take care of Mary now. And so Jesus made provision for her. Mother, look to your son and uh, then he said to the disciple, John, look to your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. From that hour. You know what that means? He understood what Jesus was doing. He said, Mary, let's go. From this point on, John was no longer an eyewitness of the crucifixion. And if you look at the differences between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and what John writes, John leaves a couple things out. Why? He was no longer there. And he was writing, writing from his eyewitness account. He still includes the final things that happened, you know, the, uh, the, the crying out of it's all done. But he, he certainly, you can tell that his eyewitness account ends because John fulfilled Jesus' witness to take Mary home, to get her away from the crucifixion scene. What a, I mean, that's an amazing uh, amount of awareness as Jesus was suffering for the sins of the world and he was literally being tortured for the debt that we owe. Now, on this Mother's Day, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Jesus, okay? And I'm saying, wow, he's on a cross suffering and dying and he realizes his responsibility to his parents. Honor your father and your mother. And his dad was no longer there, or he wouldn't have had to really take care of it, although he would want to make sure his mom and dad were situated. Um, but he makes sure that he covers for her, and he sends her on her way. And on this Mother's Day, as I think about one of the responsibilities that we owe toward our parents, making sure that they're well situated um, is, is an important thing. When my dad died in 2006, we sat down with my brothers and sisters and we, we talked about where would be the best place for mom. Now, mom was still staying in the home that they heard my dad had, but we knew that wasn't going to last forever. So we started to make provision. We all realized that Dawn and I, we would have the best opportunity to care for her in our household. Our kids were moving along and about to be out of the house relatively quickly. And so we moved down, my mom down from Wisconsin, and that worked for everyone. My sister, everyone got involved and helped. I mean, they came down and helped, and we had a chance. Whenever we had to get away for something, they'd come down and wa they'd watch over my mom. Um, you know, it says, um, when the word honor means it includes the idea of financial report, uh, support, okay? And so we want to make sure that our parents are taken care of and that they aren't living in poverty. That's one of the responsibilities we have. And I don't talk about this much, but I'm going to highlight it today so that you understand. Uh, we were about to become empty nesters. One of the things that happens when empty nesters are empty nesters is the wife usually gets a job often because it increases and enhances the income of the household as you're heading toward retirement. When we took my mom in, we knew full well that meant Dawn was not going to have income as a, for a second household. You know, and, and be able to do anything that would bring in extra income. Now, you can do the math. My mom lived with us 11 years. 
And I'm not saying that so you pat us on the back and you say, wow, what an incredible... No, people do this all the time. It's, it's because we understand about honoring. I'm telling you, there's always a price. But God will do more than you can ask or imagine if you're willing to die to yourself in that particular area and be able to do the thing that is right and proper for those who have come before you and who have brought you up. And so I'm looking at this today and saying, there's no way we did as good as Jesus did. I'm just telling you. Okay? <laughs> no, that didn't happen. Okay. However, we did our best. That we, in our weakness, were able to do. And I'm encouraging you always. Now, sometimes you can't have your mom. There's, I'm, again, six siblings. And honestly, as you go down the list of my siblings, we all realize there were practical reasons it would not work here, it would not work here, it would not work here. And in my household, it would work. And um, we even rented a house and then bought the property. The house that we lived in up in the hills was because it fit my mom. And it fit her perfectly. And we got the blessing of living in that house until we sold it to be able to help build this thing out. And then we went and rented a house in another area, which was in, I mean, of all places. I mean, we had to go into real impo- poverty. We had to live in the hill, or excuse me, in Eagle Trace. Again, because the house was the, the right type of house for my mom. It fit her. By then, she was limited to a wheelchair, and she needed to be close to the bathrooms, and she needed a whole section of the house to herself, and we were able to do that, and we had an incredible rental deal at that house, and so we were able to, to take care of that, and we lived there for three years, even a, a year after my mom died, um, while we looked for a new place for us to be able to live, or while we thought about it, at least, and then the Lord went, hey, it's time, and we did. Okay, we got something. But um, I, this, this is something on this Mother's Day, when the Lord puts this scripture in front of us, he's highlighting the importance of making sure that we as God's children honor our fathers and mothers. You know, the, there's far more to it than this. Even when I talk about Eric Metaxas in the book on Luther, we honor our spiritual heritage. And by the way, if you're Protestant, Luther is in your spiritual heritage. And um, we honor that heritage by learning more about who it is that was a part of our family line. So all of that ties together. Okay, this is uh, my Mother's Day message. After this, when G- John Don's clapping... After this, she's saying God finally did it to him. He had to preach some level of Mother's Day message on Mother's Day. I generally speaking, you know, just skip through. We celebrate the day, we greet, we, we you know, pray, whatever. Um, but I don't preach my messages around Mother's Day or Father's Day. Um, I generally don't observe Hallmark holidays. And yet it's biblical to honor our fathers and mothers. So, okay. After this, when Jesus recognized that all things had already been completed, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. A container full of sour wine was lying there, so they attached a sponge full of sour wine to a hyssop branch and brought it to his mouth. Okay, this is pretty interesting. Jesus recognized that all things had already been completed. The Greek word is tetelestai. What's the last word that Jesus shouts from the cross? Tetelestai, same word. So right before he shouts it, John uses it in the same grammatical form, really, in, in, to be able to say um, it's been done. Jesus recognized it's been done. Done. It was completed. By the way, this scripture is the reason we know that he did not descend into hell to, be, to suffer at the hands of Satan. Whenever you hear a theologian saying that, or whenever you hear someone saying that Jesus, you know, there's like in movies or videos or fine Christian videos, and you see Jesus suffering in hell at the hands of the, the, the demons and Satan, it, it, it misses that it's completed. Why would he suffer anymore? It's completed. He wasn't a masochist. No, I think I'll descend into hell and let Satan beat me up a little bit. Well, that makes no sense. And it's, this was completed. It says, by the way, Peter says he descended into the lower earthly regions, the, the, the hell, Tartarus. He has descended there to preach to the spirits in prison. Remember, Sheol at that time was... Paradise, where the believing saints went, 
until Jesus paid for sin, they couldn't come into the presence of the Father. They had to stay, but it was a par- called paradise. And then there was Hades. That was the punishment side. And we get that picture clearly when Jesus talks about the rich man and poor Lazarus. Okay, so that's that Jesus, when he descended, went to these guys. He preached to the spirits in prison and he said, hey guys, it's time for a jailbreak. And he led captives in his train, but he he didn't go down there to suffer. I imagine he was seen by the guys on the other side who gnashed their teeth all the more that they had they had done the wrong thing. But it was completed. It wasn't he did not need to suffer anymore. And uh, so he knew it was completed. He was going to announce it too. Uh, the thirst from a fever would have made his uh, voice, it would have made it almost impossible for him to shout. You know, the, 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 the dehydration that he was going through. You know, I was on a plane yesterday for only, what, it's only an hour and a half in the air, hour and 45 minutes. And yet I, I make sure that I'm drinking on the, on the flight. I always drink club soda, which always makes you feel a little bit full. But it's to keep water in me so that when I land, I'm not tired. Because even though you're in a pressurized cabin, it's not pressurized at what we're used to. Especially in South Florida, where we're virtually in a liquid environment all the time. You know, I go, <laughs> I go off to Charlotte, and my, some, my legs start to itch. It's dry up there. We're so used to being in, you know, and, and my shins start to itch. And I'm going, what's that all about? It's because my skin is saying... Give us more water. We're used to water. And uh, I'm, you know, so I'm like going, geez, you guys live in this arid climate up here. No one has ever called Charlotte an arid climate, except the guys who live down here. And we say, it's just dry. Okay, especially in the winter. Um, I, in the summer, they're as humid as, in, as anyone else. But so he had thirst from this fever. And he knew all things were completed, and he wanted to fulfill the Scripture. And what Scripture is that? Well, that's Psalm 69, 21. They gave me bitter poison in my food, and they made me drink vinegar for my thirst. And uh, the wine vinegar which was being served um, was a, uh, it was, it was a... It was a refreshing drink for the troops, okay? And uh, anyway, he said, I thirst... And when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is completed. After he bowed his head, he gave up his spirit. Okay, now, there's choices you make when you translate. Scott already pointed out to me last week, look the man is not the same thing as behold the man. You know, you've all seen the movies. Behold the man. And uh, Scott even sent me the Latin version of it, Ege Homo, right? So he's, you know, he's like, Wah. and uh, but you make choices. You want to update the language, and we're all used to "It is finished." In fact, there's an incredible song, "It is finished," right? I mean, what's what's Petra's song? You'd do a much better job of that than I just did, but um, it's an incredible song. "It is finished." Can you imagine? It, it just won't sound the same. It is completed, hmm. and yet. That's what the word means. It doesn't mean he's just crossed the finish line. Okay? It means it's all been paid in full. Everything that was required is complete. And so this is a far more accurate word. It's not quite as punchy, but it's far more accurate about what it is that he shouted out. You know, when they f- look up, when they, you know, they do the archaeological digs and they find pieces of parchment and papyrus and everything, they find on bills of sale the word tetelestai written. Paid in full. This contract is completed. And that's what Jesus was shouting from the cross with one single word. If we wanted to really capture it, we'd probably say, complete! Because our salvation, our sins were paid for, and everything was complete. And there's that word, tetelestai, again. And then it says, he bowed his head 
and he gave up his spirit. He delivered over his spirit to the Father. And the sins of the world were completely paid for. And on this particular day, Mother's Day or not, we can look at the Son of Man making provision for us in every area where there was need. He didn't even leave this earth before making the provision which was necessary for her mo- his mother for her earthly life. But he didn't stop there. He made provision for her eternal life and ours as well. Lord, thank you. Thank you for following the path and living for us and demonstrating your great love so that we might be with you eternally. And Lord, we're not just looking ahead to future glory with you. We are looking to what you are doing in our lives now. And I ask that you would give us all of the benefits of eternal life now and help us to grab firm hold of them. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.